You're watching WHPS, Highland Park, Detroit. FM 88.1 WHPR, Highland Park. WVIE 107.3 FM Charlotte, Amalia, Virgin Islands. The views and opinions expressed on the following show are not necessarily the views and opinions of WHPS, its affiliates, management, or sponsors. What's happening, Detroit and surrounding areas? You are listening to 88.1 FM, Black Coffee, No Sugar, No Cream, Straight Talk with Valerie. And if you're in the Virgin Islands, you're tuning in to 107.3 WVIE. You're listening to, to us on Roku, um, Facebook Live, or RadioWeCanSee.com. I appreciate all of you, and you're in for a really, really good show tonight. You know, I'm a strong proponent of human trafficking. I have done trainings on human trafficking, talked about human trafficking on the show, brought awareness to it and all of the signs, but you know what? I didn't cover it all. There's another form of human trafficking that goes on that I didn't even scratch the surface on. And it's in the form of probate court. I will say that again. There is another form of human trafficking that I didn't even scratch the surface on. And it happens in the form of probate court. See, the death of a loved one always wreaks some type of havoc. It should bring loved ones closer together, and sometimes it does, until it's time to divide those assets up. And sometimes when you get to the point of dividing the assets, then the asses come out. So then we have all of this ruckus, right? But not just in our families. Couple this decision that you have to make about your loved one being sick, or they're deceased, or something has happened to them, and you have all of these assets that you have to divide up or deal with. And you can't seem to get a hold on it. So the next thing you, that happens, probate court gets involved. What would you do at that juncture if your loved one was forced into isolation? They were ill or not. Sometimes some very competent people end up in this situation. They've worked all of their lives. They've garnered all of these assets or whatever. And then they're deemed incompetent by a court, put into guardianship, isolated away from their family, put on some type of psychotropic drugs, and I could go on and on and on. So tonight, I have an advocate on this topic with me. And his name is... Rick Black. Rick Black is the executive director of the Center for Estate Administration Reform. It is one of them. He's one of America's leading activists and commentators spotlighting the abusive practices in the conservatorship, guardianship, and trust industries. Rick's leadership at SEER provides strong national advocacy for legal reformation of fiduciary abuse at state and federal levels. Let's welcome Rick Black to the show. How you doing, Rick? I'm doing great. Valerie, that was a great lead in. I'm impressed. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. You know, um, it broke my heart as I was doing some research to prepare for this show to see 
how dirty and nasty these people are. Um, it's entrapment. It's reprehensible. And again, it's human trafficking. It, it is human trafficking, in my opinion. It is another form of human trafficking. Tell me a yeah, little we, bit about we, how you got we, into we, this. Sure, sure. We, we coined a different term for it. We call it estate trafficking uh, because it doesn't quite fit into the federal crimes pocket for human trafficking, which is normally services, sex, prostitution, pornography, labor, etc. In this case, what they're after is the assets. Uh, and when you made the comment in your intro about that's when the assets come out, uh, it couldn't be more appropriate. And those assets aren't, aren't necessarily just family. Mm -hmm. It can be caregivers, it can be strangers. And what we advocate is to beware of attorneys. Uh, because they carry a very unique position in our society and have quite a bit of latitude and influence in society. Uh, we got into this now seven years ago, 2013. Uh, unfortunately, my wife's father, she's an only child. He had all of his estate documents uh, executed, but he got dementia and he lived 2,000 miles away from us. And although we felt that he was getting appropriate companionship and care from a longtime family friend, uh, what we found was that she decided she was going to exploit him. And when we discovered the exploitation and theft and went to his aid, that's when we really understood the risks of falling vulnerable in the United States because attorneys kicked in, uh, that forced a guardianship proceeding, and we ultimately lost, uh, the entire family lost. He was removed from our ability to talk to him, to be with him, to take him out to dinner, and he died two years later, his foot back black with gangrene in the home of his exploiter. Uh, fortunately, we got the evidence elevated to law enforcement and she was eventually convicted of theft and exploitation, but that occurred two years after his death and after a loss of over a million dollars wow. by the family. Yeah. And that journey um, caused us to cause me to leave my profession. I'm an engineer by training. Uh, my wife's an accountant by training. Um, I had a wonderful career and loved what I was doing, spent a lot of time in Detroit in automotive over the years, uh, but it was clear that this issue was not being addressed really at any level, and I felt that I had some skills that could be brought to bear to hopefully bring about reform and redress nationally to, uh, to help a lot of innocent victims. Wow. You know... When I was doing my research, I kept coming across the term incapacitated. And it seems like that is a term that unlocks this greed-based process. Yes. What is the anatomy of an involuntary guardianship? What dictates that? How does that start? What, how does that happen? Well, it starts... Most times it starts quite altruistic. It's, it's a family who has a young adult uh, who's disabled mentally, for, for definitely mentally, because you can be physically handicapped and fine mentally and make all the decisions for yourself until the day that you don't have that ability. But when you become vulnerable mentally, uh, your, your loved ones have really two options. They can execute a durable power of attorney and a healthcare advance directive, which you can do for free. And that allows that loved one, most often an ap a parent, to continue to care for that person into adulthood. Certain circumstances, when you haven't uh, formalized those documents, you have to go to court and have a judge sign a document that deems you to be an alleged, you walk in as an alleged incapacitated person. Uh, you walk in with a neuro 
psychiatrist, that's usually the best expert to do these assessments because you want to make sure that it's a long-term permanent um, mental deficiency that you're, you're rating. You can become vulnerable mentally when you're drunk, when you're high, when you have a UTI, when you have a B12 deficiency, and you, bec you can become vulnerable when you have permanent long-term dementia, like Alzheimer's type. So when, when the court is being asked to give a third party the rights, all of your rights, your civil rights, the rights to your estate, the rights to where you go to, whether you go to church or not, whether you vote, where you live, who you associate with, um, you know, that it's, in, it's imperative and the law does require it that you have a mental evaluation by a legitimate professional who confirms that, yes, you are in need of a third party who will protect and care for you. Uh, most guardianships nationwide are held by family. Mm -hmm. And that's, and so we, I've been labeled many times over the last seven years as anti-guardianship. And that couldn't be further from the truth. There are times when guardianship is absolutely necessary because there is no other less restrictive option to protect that individual. The problem we get into and what SEER advocates for nationwide is when attorneys make the decision of capacity. And that happens quite often for three separate reasons. Estate trafficking is the biggest reason. You have an estate and someone has targeted it and they know that by putting you in a guardianship, they then can take control of your estate. If you have a durable power of attorney, it can be dismissed. If you have wow. a trust, it will be dismissed uh, or the assets will be transferred to the guardian. If you have a healthcare advance directive, it will be dismissed oh, wow. and granted to a third party. Only a judge can order those changes. And that's the key point that people, your listeners need to understand. Guardianship, even if all goes well, cost the family a minimum of $3,000 a year in fees, attorney fees, court fees, because guardianship and some states call it conservatorship, that requires that you go to court. And that gives mm -hmm. a judge full abilities to make the decisions. And it's that interface between the family, the legitimate caregiver that's trying to protect a loved one and the judge, there's always gonna be attorneys that are in that interface and they will be striving oftentimes for what's in their best interest versus what's in your best interest or that of your loved one. So. People need to understand when you use the term guardianship or conservatorship, that involves a court 100% of the time, and that involves cost, which will be a minimum of 3,000 a year. And I've seen cases go as high as a million a year in fees. It also provides significant risk because now you're making, you're, you're giving the decision-making to a third party. It happens to be a judge in this case. Wow. You know, that just blew my mind because I'm thinking, you know, having a durable power of attorney and all of these other documents that you mentioned was all I really needed to do. And you're saying that at certain point during this process, that stuff is just can be null and void if a judge decides. That's right. And the key point that we make, Valerie, is when you execute a durable power of attorney and a healthcare advance directive, that's a contract. You as the person who executes that document, which you can do for free, you can download it. If you go to our website, www.searjustice.org, we have standard forms for wills, for durable powers of attorney, for healthcare advance directive. We also provide links to zoomlegal.com and rocketlawyer.com. And they have free documents. 
you can fill out those documents, go to your local bank, they'll notarize it for free, and you now have legitimate estate documents that will protect you and your loved ones. What you then have to do is sit down with that legitimate protector, preferably two that you've identified in those documents, and make it very clear to them that if at any time you become vulnerable or you become exposed to a nefarious party or you become injured or sick, that they have an obligation to step in and assist you with this contract and ensure that those, what is defined in that contract is executed. Most people are often duped by predatory attorneys to relinquish those powers when they introduce themselves into a loved one's life. And that the message that we give everyone that we counsel nationwide is understand this is a contract. It has no value if you don't give it to your loved one, signed, notarized, executed, and make it very clear to them that if at any time you become vulnerable, you expect them to get in front of that judge and stand their ground that this is your wishes and a guardianship should not be established. I agree. Um, I was looking at some of the fees and, you know, the training like for guardianship, if you don't select the person, you know, like you said, sit down with your family members, select somebody that you trust, that you feel is responsible to carry out this contract that you've entered into them with about your life. But I was looking at some of the fees, as you said, it could be $3,000 a year up to a million dollars, 200 to $500 an hour sometimes for an attorney. Is that right? Under guardianship? Every, every time. And multiply it times three, five, 10, 15. You pick the number. I've seen cases, depending on the size of the estate or the corruption of the court, that have had as many as a dozen attorneys who latch on to the guardianship and are approved to be paid from the estate by the judge. It is routine that there will be multiple attorneys, as well as the guardian, as well as court monitors, as well as neuropsych professionals that get to latch on to your state and be paid by order of the court so that these attorneys can execute their often devious plans. And at that time, at that point in time, then that person is isolated from their family as well. So when this process starts, generally, they isolate the person from their family. You can't even see them anymore, right? So you don't get visitation. You know, I've heard of stories where um, they didn't get to see their relative. And then when they finally saw them, they were malnourished. They didn't even look like the person they were before this process started. And then I've heard of cases where people were threatened to be taken to jail. Like if you show up at this nursing facility or wherever this relative is at, we will arrest you. We use a phrase to describe every one of the 3,000 plus cases that we've counseled since 2015. Isolate the victim, defame legitimate protectors, and liquidate the estate. Control of the body is critical to success in all of these cases. Control of the body or control of the estate. But most people can't get access to the estate until they get the court to order a guardianship. So control of the body is critical. And that's done in a number of ways. With the pandemic, it's been handled quite effectively through long-term care because you can't get in and visit with mm -hmm. your loved ones. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, the attorneys will come in if someone has nefarious intent and has moved into the home of a vulnerable person or has moved that vulnerable person into their home and the family is trying to get access to protect that loved one, the attorneys will move in and protect the guilty party because their number one goal in fraudulent guardianships, fraudulent conservatorships, is to create 
the guardianship, number one, and preferably one that has conflict. Mm -hmm. And if they come in and defend the nefarious party, they get natural conflict. And that creates the litigation, which can, commences the funds flow for all of their friends from the estate, as well as from the legitimate parties that are trying to protect the loved one. And you would be shocked how often it occurs. The, the other thing they get from that is now you get low cost care. You know, an average long-term care facility, a low end one's gonna cost $2,500 a month per person. Uh, the high end facilities can run as much as $10,000 a month. And that's, that's strictly long-term care. A good average is $5,500 a month. If you're willing to keep an individual with the intent of exploiting in your own home or stay in their home, that cost can be as little as zero, but never more than $500 or $1,000 a month. Mm -hmm. So the attorneys keep more of the estate for themselves. Wow. And so during this process, if the family starts, from, from my research, if the family um, starts to fight or push or advocate against any of this, the judge can write a stay away order, correct, and keep the family away and even sanction jail time if they don't stay away. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's back to the, the earlier point that Lawyers have a privilege in a courtroom. It's called litigation privilege. And that gives them the ability to lie to a judge, mm -hmm. lie in mass to a judge. And so the judge is in a, a very vulnerable position. And, and I feel for many judges because if three or four attorneys are saying that Valerie exploited her mom and we have all this proof, and yet I've known Valerie for 50 years and I know, or 30 years, I'm sorry, Valerie. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, and I know she loved her mother dearly and she would never harm her in any way. And she would never steal anything from her in any way. And this just isn't true. The judge will most often side with those two or three attorneys and their narrative and the guardianship gets created. That narrative, that, again, defame the legitimate protectors, the lawyer's incentive and benefit to defame the legitimate protector, a spouse, a sibling, a parent, a child, is universal. And the lies that I've heard about my own wife, about me, and thousands of other family members when there is material evidence that clearly refutes the claims, um, it is an inhumane existence that no one should ever go through, yet it hap happens routinely within guardianship and conservatorship proceedings. To the point, and we've actually coined a term on that called being turked, oftentimes these judges have such influence that they can parlay these false claims to local law enforcement or a local DA and get criminal charges against an innocent victim. And that's really to serve one purpose. They want you to be so intimidated that you'll mm -hmm. back away. Mm -hmm. And when you're fighting for a loved one who is being isolated that you can't see, you have no idea the treatment they're receiving and at the same time, you're fighting potential criminal charges. And most of us have never been criminally charged. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a rather overwhelming experience. You can see how most people would just back away because it becomes so oppressive. But it is far too common, particularly in Michigan. There are some counties in Michigan that have mastered the art of estate trafficking. Wow. And so the judge sets the, the rate then, you know, how is the rate set? Does the judge set the rate of how much the attorneys can bill and the pricing? Where does the rate come from? Because it's such a, I've read where um, 
a lay person can get $85 an hour for, for guardianship where these attorneys get upwards to $500 an hour. Who sets the rate? I'm pretty Nobody. sure the assets guides a lot of it because the family start out with everything and end up with nothing. So I'm sure how much is at stake plays a part. But does the judge set that rate? No, no. And that's it's there's two variables there that that really become a wild card. Uh, I've seen attorneys charge as much as nine hundred dollars a month who do guardianship. Um, they charge that whether they're opening mail whether they're answering the phone, whether they're going and emptying your garbage cans. And I've had attorneys who actually put that on their ledger and feel that they should be paid $900 an hour to be a garbage man. Uh, I've never seen a judge limit fees, whether that attorney's charging $200 an hour or $900 an hour. Certainly in egregious cases, uh, but, but those are few and far between. But for the most part, not only they, will they pr approve whatever hourly rate the attorney wants to pay themselves, but they will also approve what was the content of the work effort or the service that was provided, as well as how many hours you spent doing it. Uh, I've had hearings where families only had two weeks to prepare, and all they were asking for was an hour a month to visit with a loved one, and the attorney had the audacity to charge them $110,000 to get them one hour visitation a month with their loved one. What? These, these, that's right. And these are people who, in this case, both children were vice presidents of companies. There was no dysfunction in this family. It was just a second wife who wanted the entire estate and who knew with the help of the attorneys who were backing her that she could get the guardianship, which she did, and fully isolate him from his family. And it was all done to damage both sides of the family financially. But hours and rate is the key component and nobody sets a rate. You charge what you claim you're worth. Wow. You know, I'm sitting here um, just I'm boiling on the inside because I would catch a case probably before even anything. Get, I'd be done whip their ass and then I'm just gone. <laughs> like, OK, don't have to worry about needing me no more. I beat the brakes off her and now I'm in jail. Lord, help us all. But I could see that happening. You know, with someone, because how much love I have for my mom, you know, my dad, my grandparents, and to be put through this process, you know, I can't imagine that people don't resort to some type of violence or, you know, just become extremely depressed and sick themselves trying to even endure or fathom what this all means and it, it seems like it comes about so quick like they just pull the rug out from under you next thing you know your loved one is gone deemed incapacitated probably put on some type of psychotropic drugs or whatever and they're being told that their family doesn't want to see them that their family doesn't care about them you know or and, and so they're feeling bad and if they have any other underlying conditions i'm sure their health is just declining as the days go by but then you have these other family members who are out here fighting and fighting and fighting and then you have this one person say well it's, he's my husband now and I just want to keep him away from everyone so this is what I'm going to do okay it's oppressive Valerie um Vic loved ones who go through this we we call the victim we always call is the what they call the ward or the alleged incapacitated person, um, because that's the person who pays the price. They, the greatest price, they lose their freedoms. Mm -hmm. They lose their estate. They often, almost unilaterally, lose the relationship with their loved ones, people they trust. This is like putting a person in a hostage situation mm -hmm. until they die. Mm -hmm. They're gaslit. They're told their loved ones don't love them anymore. Mm. They're told their loved ones stole all their money. They're, they're told so many things that 
and I've seen them and been on phones with them when they're making these statements, recordings as well, that you're like, this is pure evil. It, this, this is out of the Holocaust. This is, I mean, pick, pick the vernacular, but, but it is truly evil how people can take advantage of the vulnerable and do it in plain sight in fancy suits and dresses with a court's approval. And that's why we fight so hard nationwide to get leadership educated on the risks of the probate environment, the equity court environment, guardianship and conservatorship, because the American public has been effectively duped by the legal community and the guardianship community that this is a good thing. And too often, it is completely the opposite. Yeah, because I'm sitting here, you know, I'm trying to keep all my emotions intact. I can't imagine um, having something like that happen with my mother, or my grandmother, or anybody that I love. There's an old hymn that uh, my grandmother used to sing when she needed the Lord, and it's, come on in the room. So if you hear me saying that in court, that means I'm about ready to do something that would land me in jail and tear somebody's head completely off. I cannot imagine. And I couldn't imagine being on the other end, knowing, you know, not really knowing what's going on, not understanding this process, and then feeling like my family has totally abandoned me and that they don't love me and that they spent all of my money. That wouldn't be hard for me to believe. I have mo moochers in my family. So I'd be like, <laughs> what? Who let them get a hold of my damn money? You know, or whatever. So it would just be a lot of things going on in my, in my mind about this whole process. And so as we prepare to go on, on our break... You've been listening to Black Coffee, No Sugar, No Cream, Straight Talk with Valerie. And tonight I have on the show Mr. Rick Black. And we're talking about the corruption in probate court. Um, Rick is nationally known for his advocacy work and his fight for justice. So we're going to go on a break. And when we return, we'll do a little bit more conversating about this process. Of all we have The division blinds my vision A 
of a happier decision Where the future isn't told by what you see on television And the younger generation will carry good in nation Without frustration, harsh dictation Everyone has occupations No more hesitation No more devastation No more hierarchy in conversation And no normalization Listening to 88.1 FM, Black Coffee, No Sugar, No Cream, Straight Talk with Valerie. And tonight we're talking about the devil in the courtroom, probate court. And we've talked about how the judges play a part in it and how attorneys play a part in it and how it's just uh, entrapment. And on so many levels. And I have with me nationally known advocate Rick Black. So, Rick, there are several places that are considered hot spots. Um, I know I read that Florida was one, but I was surprised to find out that Detroit is a hot spot and the state of Michigan is a hot spot, and especially in southeastern Michigan around in our area. What does that mean? Can you tell my listeners what, what does that mean? Yeah, sure. I was surprised too, Valerie. Um, I've volunteered for two organizations as a free director doing intake from 2016 until today before we created our own 501c3 foundation on this topic. Um, I had been led to believe uh, that this was really a sun state, a retirement state issue. We first were exposed to it in Nevada. Uh, we had a number of cases in California, Texas, Florida. Um, but as I continued to do intake, we got a lot of calls from Michigan. Mm. And I was intrigued, and this is going back to early 2016, I was intrigued with the volume of calls that came from Michigan. So I started researching, going into court records, looking at the laws that pertain to guardianship in Michigan. And there's, there were a couple of things that came out that really drove why guardianship frauds, trust frauds are so big in the Michigan area and particularly in Detroit. When you think back, there are a lot of non-college degreed, high net worth seniors in the Michigan area due to the automotive industry. Coming out of World War II, you had a lot of young men and women that were looking for work, and the automotive industry provided that. They made a great living. They got great pensions. They had great savings. And now those folks that were working in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s are in their 80s, and that net worth is sitting there. We, we through Bloomberg, through uh, – the, the Census Bureau, as well as the Federal Bureau, um, I used the wrong term there, but, but when you look at the finances in the state of Michigan, roughly $50 billion with a B passes generationally in the state of Michigan today. Every attorney, that's because of death, because of natural transition of wealth to the next generation, every attorney understands what that wealth is in the state, particularly around Detroit, because of the success of automotive and the wealth that, that provided families throughout the state, that money is sitting there waiting to be grabbed by nefarious parties. And guardianship is the easiest way to intercept an estate and redirect it to a third party. So when we looked at Michigan as a hotspot, it was based on the density of calls 
that were coming into our organization at the time and continues to this day, but it's also the amount of wealth that's held in the oldest generation within the state of Michigan, which is somewhat unique in the entire U.S. for particularly when you look at the weather in Michigan versus Texas or California or Nevada or the state of Florida. But that's why it's defined as a hot spot because of, uh, because of sadly the growth of fraudulent guardianships. The other thing that, that really hurts is the state of Michigan went through a process back in the 90s to incorporate reforms to make guardianship uh, more transparent, more oversight. It's called EPIC. Um, and I, I don't know what the, the acronym is, but it deals with probate and incapacitated persons and, and elder law. Um, those changes introduced the use of attorneys across the board in the state of Michigan to act as guardians. Mm -hmm. They're appointed by the attorney general of the state, of the state. They are called public administrators and they today receive the vast majority of professional guardianships in the state. So you have a situation where the attorneys control the environment, they can charge whatever they want, they're endorsed by the attorney general of the state of Michigan. Gee, that wow. seems pretty legitimate. And as a result, most families back away when the state comes in and says, you need to put your loved one in a guardianship. And that's when the fun begins for them and the inhumanity begins for a family. This sounds to me like organized crime sanctioned by the court the collusion and corruption? I do it the same way. If, if this was 1950s mafia, um, I think something would have been done about it. But because it's done under the color of law, it's done in a courtroom, it's done with attorneys in, again, fancy dresses and tailored suits, um, nobody really wants to address it. And, and that's from the very top of Michigan. It's been extreme, and every other state. I mean, there's only two states that have taken this on nationally. What we did in Nevada, because we studied over a thousand records there. And as of today, because we took that evidence to the attorney general and the attorney general agreed to do an investigation in Nevada, we have convicted 10 professional guardians and attorneys who routinely used guardianship as a map for criminal activity. The only other state where you've seen broad arrest is New Mexico. And the sad part there is the arrest occurred federally because they had six executives who ran large professional guardianships companies who were stealing from over a thousand disabled adults and seniors. And it became so obvious what they were doing, local and state law enforcement wouldn't address anything that the feds came in, did their investigation, and at this point have convicted six executives there between 2017 and 2019. The other states, almost unilaterally, once you are brought under the jurisdiction of a probate judge, law enforcement will not investigate at the local or state level. And that creates the issue because if the court has been perverted and these courts are quite dysfunctional, they make a lot of mistakes. You talked about the issues in criminal court that innocent victims get convicted. Some are sent to, the, to death row mm -hmm. or, and mm -hmm. executed. And they are totally innocent. There's, there's a great program run by Brian Stevenson down in Montgomery, Alabama. And I've talked with their people. And they fight for people on death row to get them free. And they, they free approximately 10% of the people on death row every year who they prove were innocent when they were convicted. Well, there's a lot of oversight, a lot of checks and balances and controls within the criminal prosecutorial arena that 
is supposed to protect those innocent individuals, yet it fails. Over here in the equity court, which is where probate is administered, it's a very low burden of proof. So you have completely good families, innocent families, in essence, being civilly convicted when you create a guardianship, and they pay a dear, dear price. Yes, they do. Due to that conviction. Emotionally and physically and everything else. So let's look at this clip of this one Metro Detroit dad who said the um, probate scandal almost cost him $70,000. Let's take a listen. Seven investigators have been exposing a disturbing pattern of some public officials and real estate brokers taking over estates after someone dies, leaving the rightful heirs with very little. Yeah, seven investigator Heather Catalo's stories have been prompting calls for the law to be changed. Now she's uncovered yet another problem with this probate practice, Heather. Well, first, our investigation got attorney Cecil St. Pierre suspended from working as a public administrator. Now he's been forced to resign that post, and he's about to face a judge. We need to talk to you real quick, sir. Yeah, we do. Cecil St. Pierre is an attorney. He's also the Warren City Council president. And sometimes he really doesn't like answering questions. Hey, Mr. St. Pierre, we just want to talk to you for a minute. The seven investigators first showed you last fall how Macomb County real estate broker Ralph Roberts had teamed up with St. Pierre to open probate estates after someone dies. Say, I find properties. I believe there's a benefit, so I then tell public administrator, here's a benefit here. As an attorney general appointed public administrator, St. Pierre could legally open the estates. Then they would bill those estates for thousands of dollars, leaving actual heirs with very little. They messed with the wrong, the wrong family this time. Before Peter Georgeski's mother passed away last August, she deeded her Warren house to her son. When Georgeski later found out that money was owed for a small loan on the home, his lawyer tried to address it with the bank. But without warning, Georgeski says the house was sold at sheriff's sale. No notice to myself, no notice to my attorney that this foreclosure was happening on April 7th. Luckily, Georgeski says he had a friend in attendance at that sheriff's auction who witnessed Ralph Roberts losing a bid for that house. So my understanding is that he was furious that he didn't win the bid. In the end, there was a surplus of $70,000 from the sale. That surplus should go to Peter Georgeski as the original owner of the home. But Georgeski says St. Pierre and Roberts tried to take that cash. The same exact day Cecil opens a probate case. It doesn't even wait 24 hours that day, within that hour that that auction closed. This is St. Pierre's petition to take over the probate estate for Georgeski's mother. The only asset he lists, that $70,000 surplus. And look who paid the fees to open the estate. Ralph Roberts' company, Probate Asset Recovery. That's ridiculous. None of that is their money. It's sickening to think that there's people out there like that, and he's, he's got to be stopped. Ultimately, Georgeski got the surplus, paid off the debts, and sold the home, although he still had to go to court to get Cecil St. Pierre removed from his mother's probate case. But St. Pierre did not show up. I am going to set this matter for a show cause so that Mr. St. Pierre can explain why he failed to appear at the court this morning. That means next Monday, Mr. St. Pierre will have to show the judge why he should not be held in contempt of court. So that was just one of many cases when I was doing research on this particular topic. Again, I, I just, I'm floored because I'm thinking that I'm doing everything right in preparation for, you know, if my mother became sick or even transition, I'm thinking the documents that we have in place, the durable power of attorney and all of these things are good. And then I run across stories such as this. I'll make you even sicker, Valerie. <clears throat> I know Heather Catalo. I've had a number of chats with her over the years. And I called her and congratulated her when that story first aired back in 2017. Because, and, and also gave her the heads up that, look, what St. Pierre did on this decedent estate case is the tip of the iceberg because what is going on in guardianship is far worse in the state of Michigan. And, and Heather went on 
and ran several pieces on guardianship out of WXYZ there in Detroit. But the bigger issue is Mr. St. Pierre and two other public administrators appointed by the Attorney General of the state of Michigan were, quote, removed from office as public administrators. All that meant was that the Attorney General removed them from a list that said they carried the title of public administrator. Mr. St. Pierre and the two other attorneys, Barb and Andrew Gilly and John Munger, continue to operate over in Oakland County Court to what? this very day. Absolutely. They paid no price. Mr. Roberts paid no price. The FBI raided his office, but he was never arrested. He was never indicted. And now we're sitting here three years later and all four of those individuals who were named in the expose that WXYZ produced are still making millions off the vulnerable in Oakland County, Michigan. Wow. So he was in contempt of court because he didn't show, according to this yeah. news clip. And you're saying yeah. to this date, no further action has been taken. His name no. was just removed off of the list to be a probate attorney or devil in the courtroom, but he's still practicing and That's still right. stealing That's and it's right. still corrupt. He's an ass. Yeah, he didn't return the money that he inappropriately took because he defrauded the court to convince them that he deserved the money and the family didn't. Um, he still has a law license. He still operates in the probate environment with the full blessing of all the judges who knew what he did back in 2017. All three of them. Matter of fact, Barb and Drugely was hired as the probate administrator by Oakland County Court, and she now reviews every petition for a decedent estate probate action. She can profile every case that comes through and distribute it to her cronies at will. And yet, we would assume that what happened three years ago, she got disbarred and might be in jail today. No, she got rewarded. She got rewarded by the system who protected her all along, the Oakland County probate court system. Wow. I'm not shocked by that. You know, the collusion and corruption in the court system. And I've seen it so much with some of the other advocacy work and some things that I've been doing with Survivor Speaks on the wrongful convictions and things of that nature. It is a mess. All of those people are in cahoots with one another and they will not do us right to save their lives. And I believe that if they get rid of the indemnification, you know, and, and charge these people, you know, charge them. But I don't even know if I'll see that in my lifetime, but I hope so. I hope Me so. Too. So, Rick, you know, we got a couple more minutes. So what I want to do is give you the opportunity to let my viewers and listeners know how they can get in touch with you. What, what are your services? What do you do at SEER? How can they get in touch with you if they need to ask any questions? If they want to donate to SEER, do you take donations? Like, let us know a little bit more about your organization. Sure. We're a recognized 501c3 nonprofit foundation. We're located here in Charlotte, North Carolina. We work seven days a week for free. Our services are no charge. We do accept donations as a nonprofit, and we use a network of about 50 volunteers nationwide that are divided into geographic locations who we use for local assistance uh, with victims and victim loved ones. Um, what we do, because we're not attorneys, we don't give legal advice, we give practical advice. We reinforce that it all starts with making sure you're prepared, have that durable power of attorney executed, notarized, give a copy to your loved ones so that they understand this is a contract between you and them and your ex expectations on their performance if you become vulnerable or targeted. Same thing with the healthcare advanced directive. Have your will executed, notarized, 
have it in a safe place. Make sure your loved ones know where it is. And be very discerning on who you contract with because not only do you have to trust them, but they have to be courageous. They're gonna have to be individuals that will come to your aid. And that's sometimes more challenging, uh, more challenging to most people. But we counsel people on how to protect themselves. And when they find themselves in the situation, uh, our advice is advice that no attorney will give you. Uh, the legal community does not want to admit that this system is broken. The guardianship community, the professional guardianship community will not admit the system is broken. The judiciary will not admit the system is broken. Mm -hmm. And law enforcement tends to move away and give them free reign because of the jurisdiction of a probate judge. So the, the guidance we give people on how to exit is just good practical advice. Um, and that's, that's complex because it's emotional, it's financial, it's fraught with risk because these people are professionals. When, once you're in a guardianship, you are like a person who's never passed a football and they all are on an NFL team. And don't assume in any way that you're going to outsmart them or compete with them because they're playing with home field advantage when you're in the courtroom. And once that first order temporary guardianship is signed, it's pretty much game over mm -hmm. unless you really adopt some unconventional warfare tactics as a coalition. This is important that you talk about it. Once you realize you're in trouble, You've got to get linked up with a local activist coalition uh, who can help you understand the players, understand where you have opportunities, where you have massive risk, because this is not something contrary to what you'll read on the internet. Uh, once you're in a fraudulent guardianship, there is no redress in the public safety apparatus. They back off and let you be it's like jackals feeding on a carcass. It is an experience you do not want to go through alone. I agree. Well, thank you, Rick. I also want to give a special shout out to uh, Jody White and White House Productions for even um, putting us together to highlight this very important topic. And this is just show number one of a series. So every third Monday of the month, we will be coming back talking about devils in the courtroom and the probate collusion and corruption. So stay tuned for more. And Rick, I hope you do come back and share more of your expertise with our listeners because we definitely want to educate the public on this process. It's been a Thanks, pleasure. Thanks, Valerie. You have been listening to Black Coffee, No Sugar, No Cream, where I don't try to spill the tea or make you feel dazed like you drank a shot of cheap liquor. I just want you to see things from a different point of view. And tonight it was mine and Mr. Rick Black's. Stay tuned for this series. It can help you and your family stay away from the devils in the courtroom. We'll see you next week. Good night.